Welcome. I'm Liz Perry, the director of the Harvard Yenjing Institute. And on behalf of the Harvard Yenjing Institute, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this roundtable entitled Encountering China, Michael Sandel, and Chinese Philosophy. As you no doubt discovered uh, when you walked into this event, there is a new book that has just been published by Harvard University Press with exactly that title. And this event was convened to coincide with that uh, publication hot off the press from Harvard University Press. And indeed, we'll have a book signing immediately after this event for those of you who might want to have uh, the author or one of the two editors, I should say, um, sign the book. This book includes chapters by scholars of Chinese philosophy located both inside and outside of China, commenting on points of convergence and divergence between Professor Sandel's ideas and central concepts in Confucianism and, to a lesser extent, Taoism. The, and this roundtable today provides us with an opportunity to deepen that discussion with leading scholars uh, from Asia, leading scholars of East Asian thought from China, Hong Kong, Korea, and Japan. It's a chance for us to think about connections and contradictions between Professor Sandel's arguments about social justice, about civic virtue, about communitarianism and republicanism as they relate to themes in East Asian ethical and political thought. It's also an opportunity for us to consider why it is that Professor Sandel's writings and his lectures have resonated so strongly with ordinary people and particularly younger people in China and across East Asia. Professor Sandel first visited China a little over 10 years ago in the spring of 2007. And since then, he's returned six times to China, each of those times for high profile lectures and book tours, for press interviews and dialogues with prominent Chinese thinkers, symposia on his writings, most recently even participating in a public forum on the Beijing government's proposals to relieve traffic congestion in the city. <laughs> now, unfortunately, judging from my last trip to Beijing, Michael, where it took me more than two and a half hours to get from the airport to Peking University, I don't know how effective that particular intervention uh, was, but in any case, it is a testimony to the enthusiasm with which Michael's ideas are greeted in China. The China Daily, which is the main English language newspaper in China, put it this way, Professor Sandel is someone who in China has attained, quote, a level of popularity usually reserved for Hollywood movie stars and NBA players. <laughs> so we have here the Dennis Rodman uh, of the <laughs> Academy, as it were. And this situation is not limited to China. Professor Sandel fills sports stadiums holding more than uh, 14,000 people in Seoul. Uh, his lectures are aired over NHK in Japan, and so forth. And this phenomenon, of course, isn't restricted to East Asia. When I suggested to Michael today as uh, a good date for this roundtable, he modestly asked whether anyone would actually show up on a Friday afternoon uh, to engage in this kind of discussion. And the size of the audience here, I think, is proof of his uh, appeal here at Harvard as well. So what explains this exceptional interest in Professor Sandel's work? Uh, he is a professor of government here at Harvard University with many books to his name. But there are, after all, other professors of government at Harvard University with many books to their name. And they don't have the rock star status, either here at Harvard or in East Asia. Of course, a lot of the explanation lies with Michael's wonderful knack 
in both his writings and his lectures for making difficult philosophical arguments accessible and relevant to current everyday concerns that we all face. Some of this popularity, I think, is also attributable to what I believe to be an admirable thirst on the part uh, of the younger generation in East Asia and in this country as well, searching for answers in a rapidly changing world, a world of commercialization, a world in which technical advances seem to be outpacing our ability to really understand them or to understand their consequences. Uh, here at Harvard, as many of you know, Professor Sandel's huge lecture course on justice has long been one of the most popular courses on campus. Uh, and more recently, also Michael Pewitt's course entitled Classical Chinese Ethical and Political Theory has also been a tremendous draw here at Harvard, enrolling hundreds of students every semester. Now, the popularity of these kinds of courses undoubtedly is a testimony to the quality and the charisma of the professors who teach them. But I think they're also a kind of testimony to the thirst of students around the world for solutions to global political and ethical dilemmas and a willingness of students, both in this country and in East Asia, to look beyond the moral conditions uh, or the moral um, traditions of their own political cultures in seeking meaningful answers. We should all, of course, be cognizant of our own traditions and look within them for answers to contemporary solutions. But at a time when we're wringing our hands about the rise of youthful nationalism around the world. It's also, I think, refreshing and reassuring to see that there is a kind of youthful cosmopolitanism on the rise, an enthusiasm for searching beyond one's own cultural horizons to find resolutions to common problems. So we have this afternoon a wonderful lineup of scholars from East Asia to help us navigate this global philosophical encounter. Um, I would like to just very briefly introduce them to you. Um, of course, Michael Sandel is right here, the Harvard professor with whom, uh, of whom I was speaking. But joining him uh, today for this roundtable is uh, on his immediate left, your right, uh, Professor Joseph Chan, a professor in the Department of Politics and Public Administration at the University of Hong Kong, where he teaches political theory and is the author of many important books and articles, including a book entitled Confucian Perfectionism, a political philosophy for modern times that was published a few years ago by Princeton University Press. And uh, I'm proud to also mention that Professor Chan was a visiting scholar at the Harvard Yenjing Institute in 1999 to 2000. Next to Professor Chen is Professor Chu Hongmei. She is Professor of Philosophy at Jilin University uh, in China. She has the advantage of actually coming to us from a climate that's even colder than what we're experiencing here today. So she told me how warm uh, and welcome she feels here in Cambridge. Um, her specialty is Kantian cosmopolitanism and Marxian moral theory. And she has written insightfully on Kant's impact on contemporary political philosophy. And I'm pleased to report that she, too, was a visiting scholar at the Harvard Yenjing Institute in 2010 to 2011. Next to her, uh, Professor Ham Chai Bong is president of the Asan Institute for Policy Studies in Seoul, Korea. Formerly, he was a professor in the political science department of Yonsei University in Seoul. And he has written many influential works on political issues uh, concerning East Asia. He was co-editor of a volume entitled Confucianism for the Modern World, published by Cambridge University Press. And then uh, next to Professor Ham is Professor Inoue Tatsuo, who is professor of the philosophy of law at the University of Tokyo in Japan. He has written widely on questions of global justice, liberal democracy, human rights, and he has co-edited a volume that's entitled The East Asian Challenge for Human Rights. So we will have 
brief uh, opening presentations by each of these four panelists, and then we'll give uh, Professor Sandel an opportunity to respond uh, to their comments. We'll allow for some back and forth interchange among the panelists, and then we expect to have plenty of time also to open up the floor to your questions that may be directed either to Professor Sandel or to any or all of the other panelists. So please join me uh, first uh, in uh, welcoming here to the floor Professor Joseph Chan. Hello. <coughs> Speaking, you hear me clearly? Good. Uh, it's my great pleasure and honor to participate in this roundtable on Professor Sandel's new book. And I'm grateful for Professor Perry and Harvard Yenjun Institute for, for the kind invitation. I only have 10 minutes, so I'm not going to waste any time on more sort of uh, courtesy remarks. Uh, we have had <laughs> long relationship with Michael, and, uh, but this is not a time to bore you with these details. Uh, in the last chapter of this new book, uh, Sandel opens and closes his response to critics by sharing his thoughts about how to do dialogue across cultural and philosophical traditions. The questions are, what do we want to achieve in such a dialogue? What is the best way to proceed? Sandel has, has reservations about an approach that takes Chinese and Western traditions of thought at a high level of generality characterizes them in wholesale fashion, and then identifies similarities and differences between them. Doing comparative philosophy in this way, he says, quote, risk stripping traditions rich with nuance, internal tensions, and interpretive disputes of the very disagreements that make philosophy interesting. End of quote. Another quote is that this generalizing impulse is in some respects anti-philosophical, end of quote. Sandel reminds us that comparative philosophy should be in itself an activity of philosophizing. As he says, identifying the differences of cultures and traditions of thought is not the point of the exercise. The point is rather to invite the participants to reflect critically on hard philosophical questions and to reason together with those who disagree with them. I share a lot about this approach that Sandel has advocated through many years. And indeed, uh, Sandel has done a superb job in inviting his audience, millions of people in the US, East Asia, and the rest of the world, to critically reason together on hard philosophical questions. He challenges people's settled assumptions, he sets numerous young minds on the path to democracy, uh, to, to, on the path of uh, philosophy. Interestingly, in this new book, he engages in, in a series of discussions with Chinese interlocutors in the reverse order. Instead of posing challenges to his interlocutors, Sandel is being challenged by his Chinese philosophy scholars. And he engages his critics, but in the same spirit as he advocates uh, in his public dialogues and public lectures. Sandel explores his critics' thoughts respectfully and sympathetically. He indicates where his sympathies and sensibilities lies in those contrasts without closing off the debates unnecessarily uh, by simply rejecting other views or reinstating his own. Now, one of the things that I find most, in most interesting in this dialogue is that in responding to his critics' challenges, Sandel discloses more clearly his own normative orientations and sensibilities. For many years, Sandel's major effort has been to criticize contemporary liberalism and its thin vision of the self, society, and politics. But when facing some of the confusion challenges expressed in this book, I can see him feeling quite uneasy about this thicker conception of the self, of virtue, of moral leadership that his critics advocate. So Sandel seems to be 
you know, is less of a liberal than many mainstream liberals, but more of a liberal than many mainstream Confucians. <laughs> Actually, I find myself in similar situations. I've been a Confucian scholar and I'm a critic of contemporary liberalism, but when I was confronted by the more fundamentalist thoughts of some mainland Chinese Confucian scholars, um, I realized that I, have my, I may have swallowed a, a, a large dose of the poison of liberalism already. <laughs> but let me talk about Sandel, not myself. Uh, when Li Chen Yan, one of the authors in the book, wants a strong community with members sharing a thick conception of the common good and giving priority of place to harmony, Sandel says he takes clamor, dissonance, and moral disagreements as signs of a healthy pluralism in a community. When Bai Zhong Tong wants more elitism and meritocracy than democracy, Sandel prefers to put faith on democratic deliberation by fellow citizens about the meaning of the good life. When Huang Yong and Chen Lai argue that political virtue and personal moral virtue are more or less the same, and that the state should not hesitate uh, in embracing and promoting full moral virtues, Sandel feels the need to make a more nuanced differentiation of the two sets of virtues. In terms of uh, ideal normative orientations, I may be closer to the Confucian side than to the side of Sandel, but in terms of realistic aspirations, I have quite a lot of sympathy with his sensibilities. Uh, you may call these sensibilities liberal and democratic sensibilities, but I think I might understand what, where these sensibilities come from. I like to call these sensibilities sensibilities of the modern. Modernity, to put it in most simplistic terms, means the disenchantment of the world, the loss of the sacred, the disappearance of the, dis, the, of the aristocratic class and its accompanied virtues and rituals, and the breakdown of social authorities across society. In many ways, Liberalism and democracy are just the products of modernity, and some would say they are the most fitting response to it. Now, to me, the central challenge for Confucianism is sociological rather than normative. How can a thick community constituted by a shared vision of virtue and the common good be possible without a state engaging in ideological domination? Many Confucian scholars, myself included, have argued that uh, traditional Confucian insights and values can have a lot to contribute to the modern world. But we have yet to grapple with the sociological challenge of advancing the Confucian agenda in modern society. However, even Sandel's more moderate civic republicanism is not entirely free from this challenge of modernity, I would say although his task might be a bit less daunting than Confucian. To give just an example, he insists in finding the telos or purposes of our social practices to settle questions of distributive justice. But we could ask this question to Sandel. In a disenchanted, disenchanted secular world where people disagree often very strongly among themselves about the very purpose of the social and political order, the hope of reaching agreement by public deliberation on these hard philosophical questions seems a little unrealistic. Now, in, in the face of the challenge of modernity, I'm not saying that Confucians should therefore give up their ideal conceptions of the good life or society. To give them up is to give up the most noble part of our humanity, according to Confucianism. But any serious advocates of Confucianism like myself and the contributors in this book, or advocates of civic republicanism like Sandel, should tell people why their idea is not only attractive, but also feasible, even in such an inhospitable conditions of modernity. Let me close by going back to my first point. Sandel says the point of dialogue is to promote a genuine kind of philosophizing that challenges unsettled assumptions and engages uh, people with reason. But this critical unsettling nature of philosophizing might have an unintended consequence of reinforcing moral disagreement, which 
if not carefully understood or conducted, could easily erode whatever are the remaining shared values that can serve as a foundation for moral regeneration. In the book's foreword, Evans Osnos told the story of a girl named Shi Yi, who said that Sandel's books and lectures are a key to open her mind and doubt and question everything. Now, the key word, I, say, I think, is everything. One may question not just about injustice or immorality, but also virtues and, moral and morality. Many students have told the same story to me. After taking philosophy classes, they find that they can't believe in anything. <laughs> so philosophizing is a double-edged sword. It may strengthen one's conviction after critical reflection, but it may also lead to despair and disbelief. From a sociological point of view, this free and ceaseless activity of doubting and questioning while, while taking place in a society already lacking strong social forces or social forms of life to support virtues and a shared good could just easily undermine the kind of shared community that Sandel himself wants to reinvigorate. So I want to end my speech with a question for Sandel. Other than promoting free and public philosophizing, what could we realistically do to foster confusion or civic republican ideals of virtues and community in modern society. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Chu. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I really appreciate the invitation of uh, Professor Perry and the uh, Harvard Yanqing Institute. It's my honor to be here to take part in this event. And uh, eight years ago, I participated in a similar uh, event at Boston University, uh, which was for the publication of the book titled China Today, China Tomorrow. At that time, I had a question. Since it was a book aiming at showing various aspects of uh, China's uh, development, why all the papers in the volume were only in the context of uh, domestic uh, politics, economy, and the society of China? Why there were no papers on culture and philosophical change in China? So right now, when we have the book in Counting China, at hand, I think we can treat with the question in another way. So the title of my presentation is uh, Chinese philosophy and philosophy in China today. And as to Chinese philosophy, I want to talk about two points. One is mentioned by several scholars in the book. The other is as important as uh, the first one, I think, but unfortunately uh, not mentioned much by the authors. The first one is about the uh, philosophical approach in Chinese philosophy, and I think it is moral anthropology. In the Encounting China, quite a few of uh, Chinese uh, scholars and uh, experts uh, in Chinese philosophy bring about dialogues between Chinese thought and uh, Professor Sandel's thought in the context of uh, Confucian philosophy and Daoist philosophy. As most of the readers notice, the tradition of uh, Chinese philosophy is centrally concerned with uh, questions about how we ought to live, what uh, goes into a worthwhile life. This is actually, I think, uh, practical philosophy or moral philosophy in a broader sense. However, there are no definite moral laws or categorical imperative in the sense of Immanuel Kant uh, expressed clearly in Chinese philosophy. So the question is, how can Chinese philosophy work in the practical life? Professor Sandel's observation is that Confucius and Mencius do not enunciate abstract uh, principles, but convey their moral teaching uh, through stories and the particular cases. Definitely, there is no uh, universal law raised in Chinese philosophy. Instead, we can find the fundamental rules innate in the moral discourse 
and the dialogues that the masters told to the disciples, the fathers to the sons, and the ancestors to the de descendants in their doctrines and uh, family instructions. This is not metaphysics of morals, but moral anthropology, which plays an important role in making the canonical uh, text acceptable to a much broader range of readers than the usually obscure philosophy text that see critique of pure reason. So the second point is about uh, the contribution of uh, Chinese philosophy to cosmopolitanism. When I spent the year from uh, 2010 to 2011 at Harvard Yanjing Institute, I worked uh, on Kant's cosmopolitanism. Kant is firstly a moral cosmopolitan insofar as he views that all rational beings are citizens of a super sensible uh, moral world uh, who are free and equal co-legislators. Kant then defends a political version of uh, cosmopolitanism for perpetual peace. However, Kant's cosmopolitan ideal is based on his view of an equal rational being in understanding the citizens in a republican state and the citizens in the world, world state. So someone calls it uh, individualist uh, cosmopolitanism. And John Ross's version in the law of uh, peoples, I think, follows the same logic as Kant. So Alastair McIntyre as a communitarian is uh, anti-cosmopolitan because he believes that our morality is framed in terms of uh, the membership of some particular community with some particular uh, social, political, and economic structure. Professor Sandel also argues that individualism uh, generally fails to deal adequately with the problem of personal identity in his uh, liberalism and the uh, limits of uh, justice. But we can find a communitarian cosmopolitanism in Confucian uh, philosophy with his idea of Tianxia, or under heaven, and Da Tong, the grand union. Confucius made the blueprint of uh, the cosmopolitan society as the grand union, in which the unity of heaven and human being reach a level of harmony. So he also raised the practical plan for people to achieve their own perfection and the harmonious relation between man and nature and among different persons with uh, the understanding of Ren and the Li, which is the embodiment of the spirit of heaven. Since family is the basic cell in the Chinese, philosophy, uh, Chinese society dealing with the uh, relationship between family and the other groups, it's the most important task for a person. So Confucius' method to achieve the grand union is to persuade people to treat others as members of their own families, and then to make people all over the world live as if they are part of one big family. Professor Zhao Tingyang believes that in this way, the world is not an organization of states, but a world institution. From the perspective of Tianxia, all the people in the world can reach and share the, the common good of the world because the Tianxia belongs to all of us. According to my reading of uh, Professor Sandow's writings, I think he might be interested in this idea, and there will be much more to talk about between him and the Chinese philosophers. Finally, I want to uh, say something about philosophy in China today. More and more Chinese philosophers agree that the highest aim in China's philosophy today is not to make comparative research among different resources, but to reach a higher level in understanding human life by combining different philosophical wisdom. Jonathan Wolf, the author of Why Read Marx Today, visited uh, Jilin University last year. When we talked about the possibility of uh, mutual communication among Chinese philosophy, Marxist philosophy, and Western philosophy, which are dominant parts in the academic uh, world of China today, he raised the question, how to solve the conflict between the equal concern on real men in Marxist philosophy and the definite existence of the social hierarchy in Chinese philosophy? I think this is also a question to the relation between Chinese philosophy and Western philosophy. In the traditional way, the Chinese people were educated to obey the social order innate in society with little reflection on reasons. But nowadays, Chinese people are on the way of modernity in the era of uh, globalization. There's no way back to the time of uh, Confucius and Laozi. 
So it is necessary for the Chinese people to recognize the value of democracy, liberty, and human rights in a reasonable way on the basis of their own cultural structure. So Professor Chen claims that uh, there is no way of accepting right-based uh, political thinking in Confucian uh, philosophy. So we need to think about what Chinese can learn from the West in philosophy. In the Encounting China, Professor Li Chenyang comments that Professor Sandel's version of uh, communitarianism is too thin compared uh, to the conception of community in traditional Chinese philosophy. While Professor Bai Tongdong believes that Professor Sandel's version is too thick for the society of strangers, I mean the liberal society, I think Professor Sandel's version is just the right for China's <laughs> philosophy today because it is closer to the spirit state of uh, Chinese uh, than traditional Chinese philosophy and also uh, liberal theories. So there is so much that we can learn from Professor Sandel. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Chu. Next, Professor Han. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Perry uh, and the Yanqing Institute, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a great honor to participate in this panel uh, on Michael Sandel's uh, new book. Um, I, I wanted to uh, title my very short talk as Why I Stopped Being a Confucian. Um, and, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's news to Joseph too. But uh, because as, as Dr. Perry mentioned uh, during her introduction, I, I, I had been an active, um, uh, very active in promoting Confucianism, I think up till about 15, 20 years ago, and, and when, when Daniel A. Bell and I myself co-edited the book that you mentioned, Confucianism for the Modern World, and a project in which Joseph also uh, participated. Uh, it was a time when it was very, when we talked about Confucianism and we would encounter Chinese intellectuals and they would, most of them would say, why would you, why are you talking about Confucianism? Except those in Hong Kong. Um, <laughs> because they thought, uh, for even 20 years ago, for, for Chinese intellectuals, Confucianism just was still this very uh, uh, feudal uh, philosophy that, that uh, among others, of course, Mao and, and the May 4th movement uh, have, have uh, pointed to as the, the cause of all the ills for the Chinese civilization and has been, has been chucked uh, as forcefully as possible. Now, it's fascinating to see this book in which so many Chinese intellectuals have now become Confucian in, in very 20, <laughs> very short, Years and uh, I, it's something Joseph already described, and I think the unease that that um, Michael um, Professor Sandel feels that that of course Joseph and others also detect. Uh, it's something that I I feel very uh, very strongly, perhaps even even stronger. When and and so when liberalism was the default position. Um, Criticizing liberalism, either from a civic republican, communitarian, or Confucian point of view, seemed like a like a, a, a good way to enrich the discussion, um, but also in in a sense, um, sort of a safe intellectual thing to do. But when you th when you, when you realize that that's not necessarily the case, um, then then attacking liberalism from whatever perspective is, is, a, is a very different um, enterprise. And this sort of brings me to the issue of what, what are intellectuals, are, are they supposed to be? How, how sensitive are they supposed to be to political change? Um, if you're a Confucian, do you, do you do Confucianism all the way through despite its political and social ramifications? Or do you change your position if you think that it's, it has different or, or sometimes wrong uh, implications. I think one, uh, one way to describe what Joseph just uh, talked about in terms of uh, 
Michael Sandel's uh, encounter with Confucianism is about, especially in regards to too thick a conception, you know, of that that Michael doesn't have thick enough of a conception of, of community is be careful what you wish for, Michael, is, is, is my word. Um, now, let me go back to why the three sources of my, my anxiety about and why I, of Confucianism and why I stopped being a Confucian. Because it, as you'll notice, when and Liz Perry introduced me, I'm, I'm, I'm running a policy think tank. And what's a Confucian, uh, former Confucian scholar doing? So it's sort of a effort to introduce my, uh, explain on, on my uh, biography or uh, intellectual migration. But what, when I read this book, one quote that, that really struck me, that came back to me was, and I, I couldn't find the exact quote, but it's, so I'm paraphrasing, it's Joseph Levinson's quote about Confucianism. And he said something like this. He said, the moment Confucianism started to decline in China is when Confucian and Chinese intellectuals started to study Confucianism because it was Chinese, not because it was universal, universal philosophy. And I think that's, that's what I find in this book, that the Chinese philosophers are engaging Confucianism because it's Chinese, uh, as one of, at least one of the main motivating uh, factors as to why they do this. And I think that comes through very, very strongly. Um, Secondly, uh, political, uh, as a political scientist, sort of doing a, you know, political, uh, social, political analysis of this, I really find what China, it, this book sort of um, representing the phase that China is going through uh, in a different context. I, I, play, I, this may be a different, a difficult concept for some of you to grasp, but for those of you who know something about Korean history, I, I really think this is sort of a Chinese. Um, Pak Chung Hee moment. Um, now, I, I guess it, perhaps it's easier if you if you think of the Lee Kuan Yew moment in in Singapore. That is, South Korea after going through rapid industrialization and liberalization for about a decade, through the all through the 60s. By the early 70s, uh, President Pak Chung Hee, who had engineered much of that rapid growth, decided that. There was just too much liberalization taking place too fast, and and he start he imposed uh, uh, emergency decree. He arrogated uh, power for life, and started this very authoritarian regime. And in in not only did he establish these very you know a basically police state, but what he also did of course was strongly start to advocate nationalism, and of course Confucianism. As the philosophy that Koreans should embrace as this tradition that we should rediscover, because Koreans had also chucked Confucianism as the epitome of this feudal uh, philosophy that had always prevented Korea from going uh, modernizing itself. Um, so the the parallel is just uh, quite striking and also very disturbing. Third one um, is. Um, what China seems to be going through, or, or its, its current engagement with uh, Confucianism, um, is another self, uh, Li Hongzhang moment, a self strengthening moment, Zhong uh, Ti Xiyong moment, that is, Chinese core and Western means technology, mm -hmm. that there's a way in which that, that morally, philosophically, mm -hmm. the Chinese core is always superior. And you could always bring in Western technology, industrial, uh, whatever, as accoutrements to strengthen and support the, the core Chinese uh, world. Um, and we call that the you know Yang Wu window or you know self strengthening movement. I always contrast that. For me, the the striking contrast of that particular way of encountering modernity was, of course, it is with the Meiji Restoration, which was a different way of encountering modernity, which was go modernity all the way, Westernization all the way, 
I think is, is one way to characterize that and compare it to uh, the, the self-strengthening mode of China. Now, we all know what happened at the end of the day, um, that Japan did go through a thorough industrialization, westernization, and was able to achieve its own version of modernity, which in, in many st striking ways have preserved its own tradition uh, almost better than any other East Asian countries uh, that have struggled. Really? Uh, well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a debate. OK, that's a question for you. <laughs> OK. Um, uh, you get to ask questions later. OK, so, <laughs> um, so, so is this another, another way, another Chinese moment where it, it finds an excuse to stop Thorough modernization, liberalization. Uh, we know that uh, we know that um, you know in a strange way their their uh, residences of this in, you know how to be a how to be a good communist, right? Uh, Liu Xiaoqi and and the the way even Marxists try to con combine Confucianism and and, and Marxism. Um, so is this another? Is this something very Chinese where it says okay? We need to stop here. There's some core Chinese thing, even if we have to revive it wholesale in order to, uh, to preserve uh, the Chinese worldview. So these are the, the three very political um, uh, uh, resonances that I get um, from, from uh, this book. And uh, again, um, what, it, what is the world we, we want? <laughs> and in, in a sense, I've, I have discovered my own liberal roots. I think I have also uh, swallowed that liberal poison uh, uh, much so earlier and, and deeper than I had ever, ever uh, uh, cut, uh, thought, because I really find myself increasingly veering towards the liberal position on all these issues and start starting to see all these danger signs in any kind of uh, 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 philosophy that, that emphasizes community um, and, of course, a much thicker, uh, even thicker sense of uh, community than, than the one uh, Michael Sandel advocates. Let me stop there. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> Professor Inoue. The focus of the discussion today is on this book, um, Michael Sandel and uh, Chinese philosophy. I was wondering why I was invited to join the panel, because I'm not an expert in Chinese philosophy. Uh, but in some of my earlier works, I made a kind of an immanent critique of Michael Sandel's political philosophy from a liberal viewpoint and discussed political and socioeconomic Im uh, implications of the so-called liberal communitarian debates in the context of Japan. I also published some papers where I criticized and, uh, the dichotomy of Asian and Western civilizations to find a common ground for human rights and democracy. So I understand that my role in this Colloquium is to widen the framework of our debates in such a way that uh, philosophical voice different from the uh, Confucian, Taoist, and Sandilian standpoints and the social concern of another Asian society different from China can be incorporated in our endeavor to develop the cross-cultural philosophical discussions presented in this book. I'd like to make some comments to perform this role of mine. In the book, Liberalism is depicted as a common target or beaten wall, both for Chinese philosophy and Sandel theory. Tondon Bai shows some sympathy to Rosian liberalism in the uh, conclusion of his short chapter two of this book, but he makes his claim in a very brief and brushing way. Anyway, this is an exception that makes the uh, general anti-liberal stance of the book more vivid. The different two philosophical camps, Chinese philosophy and Sandelian republicanism, may be able to make an alliance by sharing the same enemy, 
that is liberalism. This may be one strategy to bridge the gap between the two different philosophical perspectives, but I don't think it is a good way if we are to explore for a new philosophical horizon in which people with a variety of perspectives can be engaged in sincere public liberation beyond dogmatic preconception. The problem is not just that liberal perspectives are excluded from the outset. A more serious problem is that liberalism is unfairly caricatured as a philosophy that supports the socially responsible self-centeredness of deracinated individuals or the greedy pursuit of self-interest in the unregulated market economy. It seems to me that these charges against liberalism in the board are something like, to use Japanese phrase, wara-ningyo dadaki, battering a straw figure of liberalism. This is not only philosophically unfair, but politically dangerous, given the uh, current situation in the world, as you mentioned. <laughs> Anti-liberal passions and movements, such as religious intolerance, ethnic discriminations, chauvinism, like America first, <laughs> and hate speech against minorities and dissidents are mounting in the current world, including even the Western developed countries. To be sure, Sandel and other contributors to the book do not welcome these tendencies, saying that their standpoints can admit of diversity and pluralism. But this claim seems to be dependent on their own liberal interpretation or reinterpretation of Republican Confucian and Taoist values. The philosophical abnegation of liberalism is bound to undermine liberal bulwark against the current dangerous tendencies to incite intolerance and discriminations. I think that our more fruitful and more urgent task is to redefine or re-identify liberalism in such a way that its commitment to open-mindedness, non-discrimination, and free critical discussion can be more clearly advanced and separated from the negative stereotypes unduly imposed on it. If we carry out this task, liberalism will become more acceptable, both for Sandel and the advocates of Chinese philosophy, and a wider and sounder form of philosophical rapprochement than their anti-liberal alliance can be brought about. I have developed my own redefinition of liberalism along this line in my earlier works. I cannot enter into the full expression of my view here, but uh, uh, let me present uh, some of my, uh, uh, some uh, key points of my view. Uh, let me allow to use some philosophical jargon here. Three points. First, the fundamental value of liberalism is not freedom, much less negative freedom, but justice. Liberalism is committed to the uh, primacy of justice over freedom. Justice here means not one of the competing conceptions of justice, like Utilitarianism, libertarianism, or egalitarian theories of rights, but the common concept of justice that underlies and constrains these competing conceptions of justice. The normative core of the common concept of justice is the uh, prohibition of non-universalizable discrimination. It implies the test of perspectival as well as positional reversibility that can be formulated as the following maxim. Examine whether your conduct or claims to others can be justified for the reasons that you could not reject, even if you had their positions and perspectives, provided they are willing to apply the same reversibility test to themselves. Justice-based liberalism, in this sense, is diametrically opposed to self-centeredness uh, self and licentious greed. It requires as to make critical self-examination, to undertake accountability to other persons affected by our conduct and claims, and to show fairness and open-mindedness to other persons with positions and perspectives different from ours. It provides the best interpretation of two historical sources of liberalism. I mean, enlightenment as critical rationalism as opposed to dogmatic rationalism, and tolerance as open-mindedness to other persons 
as opposed to the modus vivendi type of coexistence through strategic compromise. I think that it is possible to reinterpret both the Christian golden rule, do to others as you would be done by, and the Confucian counterpart, do not do to others what you would not want them to do to yourself in this liberal way by adding the uh, counterfactual antecedent. If you were others with their perspectives as well as their positions to these two maxims. Second, anti-perfectionism is a corollary of the uh, perspective of reversibility test of justice. But it has nothing to do with the conception of the unencumbered self that Sandel critically ascribed to liberal liberalism. Sandel's own conception of the reflectively situated self or the self-interpreting being implies the individual person's responsibility to interpret her conception of the good life and the unavoidability of the proliferation of competing interpretations of traditionally shared conception of the good life in a given political community. These implications offer a reason, a good reason, to accept the liberal anti-perfectionism. But all that it means is that a virtuous life should not be legally enforced or stipulated. Public deliberation about what is a good life can be conducted without resorting to legal regulations. Moreover, even from this anti-perfectionist perspective, legal regulations can be used to facilitate people to exercise their right to develop and pursue a virtuous life as they conceive it, just as their right to pursue happiness as distinct from their right to happiness itself can be legally protected. Third and last point, the conception of the individual rights as vetoes over the collective goal has often been criticized as a symbol of liberal egocentrism. This criticism fails because it only looks at the uh, conflict between the individual interest and the communal responsibility on block. With reference to the uh, social maladies of contemporary Japan, which I call the poverty of rights blind communality, I advocated a redefined conception of individual rights as a normative device to strike a balance between conflicting responsibilities that individuals have for different spheres of com com community to which they belong, such as families, neighborhood, workplace, clubs, professional associations, local or national communities, and global human society. Its point can be briefly shown in the following way. If a specific communal sphere requires too much devotion from a person, he would not be able to perform his responsibility for other communal spheres. When the so-called kaisha shui, companyism, as a communitarian regimentation of capitalism, prevailed in Japan, this problem became serious with the result that the companies which became workers' constitutive community prosper while families and civil society are undermined. Individual rights as a veto over excessive demands from a certain communal sphere is indispensable for a person to meet competing res responsibilities for other communal spheres in a balanced way so that he can mature his communality. Sandel presented a conception of the multiply situated self in the last few pages of his book, Democracy's Discontent. I think that this view of multiplicity of our communal belongingness can lead him to accept my redefined conception of individual rights. I wish Sandel would say, Yes, that's so. You are completely <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Inoue. We have four, I think, really quite fascinating reactions uh, to this book. One, a sort of Goldilocks reaction that <laughs> Sandel got it just right, not too thick or not too thin. Um, and then three other quite different liberal critiques, um, some asking for the feasibility and the applicability of some of these ideas, and others uh, giving different definitions of what liberalism is and uh, how um, congruent with these ideals, uh, Professor Sandel's own ideas are. So let me turn to uh, Michael Sandel for his reactions.
Well, thank you, Liz, and I'm so grateful to the panelists for traveling all this way and for engaging in such a stimulating way with the ideas in the book. And uh, how to respond? Well, let me begin with the very pointed challenge that Joseph ended with, which is what can we realistically do? Can I give even a single example of what we can realistically do to foster in the modern world with all its challenges, either a Confucian or civic republican virtue? Here's one. The, the short answer is civic education broadly conceived. But that's very abstract. So I would like to give you one example um, that goes back to the time when I was uh, coaching Little League Baseball. My son, Adam, was a baseball player, and I coached his team from the time they were very young up to uh, until they reached high school. And when they were, oh, maybe 11 years old, I noticed a problem that kept happening again and again. Um, all of the kids playing baseball uh, would love to try to hit home runs. That was the most heroic thing imaginable. But when they were playing in the field, trying to field the ball and catch the ball, they often had trouble paying attention. And so I created a kind of prize. And the prize was not for the person who hit a home run or made the most spectacular play. But if, when trying to field the ball, at, at that age especially, it was not very successful. If a ball came your way and you tried to field it, often it would go through your legs. And so it was important to have other players come in case the ball came through your legs to field it and pick it up. So I, I said, anyone, if anyone succeeds in backing up a play and redeeming the error of a teammate and making an out, there, there would be a reward for the entire team and the reward was a Snickers candy bar. Now, at age 11, a Snickers candy bar was quite a strong reward. <laughs> but the, uh, the, um, the reward was only conferred for an attempt to help, to play as a team, not to seek individual heroics, and to try to attach, I tried to attach, at least some small glory and honor to that team play. Now, uh, and, and it worked. It worked. Um, soon, all the 11-year-olds were backing up their teammates. And we won the championship. And I suppose you could say that this cultivated a kind of civic republican virtue of contributing to the common good, and also a, a Confucian virtue, being part of a team, of a community. The political significance of this was not lost on some of my conservative friends. By conservative, I mean ardently individualistic capitalist friends. Because when this story was written up in the newspaper, several of them wrote to me and said, uh, complained, Sandel, you're ruining baseball. <laughs> you're destroying the individual heroics that are at the heart of the American pastime. Now, I would, I suppose, um, 
in no way sensei would say that maybe this was um, in, encouraging a kind of illiberal attitude. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. But there is in small gestures and small forms of civic education as well as large ones. Uh, there are ways of teaching virtue, not just in schools, not just didactically, but through the organization of everyday life and of social life. And that's where I think the most powerful forms of the cultivation of the kind of virtue I'm, I think civic life requires can best be found. Now, there is, uh, the, so, so that's my reply, Joseph, to your question, um, your challenge. In some ways, the, um, the other three pre presentations raise a question about, not just about academic philosophy, and whether liberalism is a necessary alternative to a conservative or hierarchical Confucian tradition, that is. But also, it, it's a, the, the, in a way, these presentations were all about philosophy in the world, philosophy as lived. And I think that's the right emphasis. We have different views, perhaps, about how best to describe the philosophies by which we live in the West, in China, in other parts of Asia. But here's my general reply to the worries, the very strong worries expressed, especially by uh, Chai Bong and by Inoue Sensei. Uh, before I, I get to that, I want to say that Professor Chu's uh, uh, presentation, uh, given her interest in Marx's moral philosophy, uh, leads me to want to hear more about whether she thinks that today in China, um, Marx or Confucianism is the more powerful, uh, legitimating uh, vision or ideal. Um, so, so that's a question that occurred to me listening to Professor Chu. Um, the response I would put to um, to Chai Bong and and uh, Inoue Sensei is this: When I first began traveling in East Asia, I noticed that most of the people who invited me the professors, the hosts, disagreed with my critique of liberalism <laughs> and thought that it was potentially dangerous for their societies and told me, sometimes more, sometimes less explicitly, that the task really was to instill liberalism in societies that were hierarchical and conservative or feudal, as some of them saw those societies. And they, they invited me even though they thought what I had to say was, was dangerous and on the wrong track, and it was what they were doing. So I kept noticing this. And what my main reply was that, oh, and, and Tatsuo actually talks about, in his always vivid rhetoric, talks about the unholy alliance of Confucians and civic Republicans. I, I, I added that. Um, trying to make a point by, <laughs> advanced by sharing a, the same enemy, the enemy being liberalism. My reply to that is, and Tatsuo knows this deep down, <laughs> that actually we have an alliance. And that is that what we share as philosophers, despite our philosophical disagreements, is that 
we are, both of us, leaning against the dominant, what we take to be the dominant self-images of our societies. Leaning against what we take to be the excesses of our societies. And that leads us to different philosophical viewpoints. But perhaps that purpose, that origin of the philosophical perspectives we advance, is a deep kind of sharing that goes beyond the actual positions and views. So that's, that was one thing that occurred to me as I listened, especially say 15, 20 years ago when I would travel to East Asia, that what I had in common with my philosophical friends, if not the actual position, was this critical stance toward the excesses as we saw them of our respective societies. But now China it poses a different kind of challenge today because what I find uh, in China is that in many ways, the audiences with whom I've engaged, especially on what money can't buy, on the moral limits of markets, their pro-market intuitions and enthusiasms are as thoroughgoing as any I've encountered anywhere else in the world with the possible exception of the United States. <laughs> when, when I travel to, uh, to, to Europe or to Latin America or to Japan, the moral intuitions in the critique of markets are much closer to mine. Uh, whereas with Chinese audiences, as with American audiences, the critique of markets and of market individualism runs very deep. And uh, so when, I, when I gave some examples to test this, for example, examples about, like, about price gouging, should there be laws preventing sellers of goods from raising the price in the wake of a national disaster, the price of a flashlight or of bottled water or of a snow shovel after a blizzard, or umbrellas after, even after a rainstorm. In most European countries, in Canada, in most of Latin America, and in Japan, if I say, how many think there's something wrong with raising the price, most people, the majority will say there is something wrong, it's unfair, and except in, uh, in the US and in China where most people think that's the way the market works. That's supply and demand. The shopkeeper could have anticipated this and stocked more shovels and made more money and so on. And so this leads me to my second re reply to, it's really to ask for a, a counter reply, to, um, to the worry that the critique of liberalism and the, the growing attention to Confucianism as a moral source, moral tradition, is uh, that these are dangerous. I think that the uh, growing interest in the Confucian tradition in China is important and worth encouraging because without some attempt to grapple with and reinterpret for the modern world the moral traditions that have the, hold the deepest claim on societies. The real danger is that uh, societies given over to market capitalism and the self-understandings that go with them wind up with, so, with a moral vacuum of meaning. After a certain period when GDP rises, people begin to ask, and I see this in China as a visitor, as an outsider, as a, 
as an observer, people begin to ask, is this all there is? GDP alone, affluence alone, prosperity alone are not sufficient sources of meaning, either to sustain a good life or to hold a society together. I think not only ordinary members of the public, but the leadership in China is aware of this. And in GDPism is not an adequate or a self-sustaining ideology or legitimating public philosophy. And in the absence, in the absence of moral meaning, there, that empty space will be filled by the default alternative, which is not liberalism or Confucianism. It's a kind of vengeful, strident nationalism. That is the default source of meaning that fills places whose moral culture has become hollowed out. <coughs> and I think we see that, tendencies in that direction today in the US, in China, and in many other places, which is why I think the project of trying to find a public philosophy rooted in, renovated, but rooted in uh, traditions of, of moral sources and meaning um, is, is enormously important if we're to create the kind of public cultures hospitable to um, the, the uh, well, the kinds of human relations and political arrangements that um, liberals and the critics of liberalism share. So really, I would like to put that in a way as a reply, but also as a question or a challenge to see whether, uh, especially the critics of the Confucian turn um, have suggested. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Michael. And, um, uh, I, I'll turn back to the panelists. You know, I guess this very interesting interchange about um, whether we have a moral vacuum in China and East Asia, and if so, whether it's wise to fill it with Confucianism, I think you know may resonate, sound differently to those um, familiar with certain episodes in East Asian history. We have, after all, the Japanese effort at state Shintoism during the Second World War, and we had right at that same moment in China, Chiang Kai-shek's effort to combine Confucianism with sort of quasi-fascism, -fasc -fasc the blue shirts in China and so forth. So there are historical episodes uh, in East Asian history where this uh, revival of Confucianism, I think, had rather unhappy um, outcomes, which may be part of the reason that some of our East Asian colleagues are um, more averse to the idea um, than, than we may be. Um, but let me turn back to the panelists. I don't know, Professor Chu, would you like to begin um, and uh, uh, answer about whether it is Marx or Confucius that has greater moral authority or greater legitimizing power in contemporary China? Uh, okay, thank you for uh, your question. Uh, it's hard to me to answer this question, which one is more powerful, but I think uh, what I want to say is that, first of all, uh, in China right now, people uh, care about moral philosophy, not in the traditional way. I mean, in the 1980s, there is a kind of uh, reform for the so-called textbook, because the textbook was written under the principle of uh, Soviet Union's interpretation <coughs> on Marxism. But uh, since the 1980s, there will have a great change in uh, Marxist philosophy in the academic world in China. So people try to reconsider uh, Marxism uh, in the perspective as uh, Marxist own writings and also in the perspective of uh, Chinese philosophy. Because Marxist philosophy and Chinese philosophy shares uh, uh, some common uh, good like uh, um, both of this kind of uh, thoughts, these two thoughts, uh, hope to to uh, give some uh, practical experience uh, to the ordinary people. 
uh, like uh, as I see that in Chinese philosophy is a kind of moral anthropology and uh, it's a kind of a culture structure in Chinese uh, people. So that is a precondition for Chinese people to consider Marxist philosophy because Marxist philosophy also uh, hope to solve the problems for the workers, the proletariat. And, uh, and Marxist philosophy cares not about the problem of uh, science. I mean, the, the classical uh, Western philosophy considering the problem of science, but Marxist philosophy considering the real life, uh, the real life, uh, the real conditional life of uh, human beings. So that's uh, what Marxist philosophy and the Chinese philosophy share. I mean, that's the common good of uh, uh, this two kind of uh, thoughts. And the other one is that Marxist philosophy is open uh, uh, with uh, practice. So uh, it's not a kind of doctrine or fixed doctrine. Uh, so with the Chinese experience, especially uh, the achievement that China made in these years, uh, the Chinese uh, scholars hope that they can understand or interpret Marxist philosophy in a Chinese way. So that's what I can answer for this question. Thank, Thank you. you. Should we ask Joseph Chan if he has some? I'll ask each of the panelists to just quickly yeah. respond to Michael's uh, comments, and then we'll open things more broadly. So, Joseph? Um, Yes, I, I think uh, Michael for the wonderful example that he gave. Uh, um, I, on a theoretical level, I agree that uh, at the end of the day, moral changes uh, would mostly come from individual agents who believe in the in the morality that they want to advocate and act upon it through interaction and association with others. Uh, but as a political theorist, or generally people who like to think about how institutions can be structured in order to make possible on a grander scale this kind of moral education, I think we should go beyond a little bit the, this individual examples of moral education. So what social institutions do we want in a pluralistic society that can do the job that you want society to do? Right. So that, that's the question I'm still interested in. Yeah, well, the, the very brief answer would be to create more public spaces and class, class mixing social institutions within uh, civil society, creating civic spaces, public gathering places to lean against the tendency today for the affluent and those of modest means to live essentially separate lives. I think that's the single, on a large scale, biggest way of Bring, uh, enabling people to encounter one another in a way that creates a sense of sharing in a common life. Can I say Please, something? Please, Professor. Yeah. <laughs> Michael uh, said that uh, I talk of an uh, un unholy alliance between the uh, uh, Confucianism and uh, Sandel, but I didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> well, let me say two things about this. <laughs> well, in 2009, we had a conference uh, featuring on Michael Sandel's political philosophy at the Chiba University in Japan. And uh, at that time, I was invited to make a comment, and uh, Joseph was there too. And uh, in that presentation of mine, I uh, said that, uh, well, what I call the uh, universalist turn of Michael Sandel from the uh, a little bit of uh, parochial com communitarianism is quite well philosophically uh, justifiable and even more liberal than the Rosian political liberalism. And I, in the end of, at the end of my presentation, I said, welcome to the authentic liberal club, to Michael. <laughs> he just smiled at me without saying thank you. <laughs> but but uh, my interpretation of Michael's political philosophy is, well, he, it's uh, one of the uh, uh, very good uh, uh, version of uh, liberal, liberalism, <laughs> if properly reinterpreted. And uh, anyway, <laughs> I, I don't go into this point. But uh, let me say something about Confucianism. As I said, I, I'm not an uh, expert in Confuci Confucianism, but I'd like to say something about Confucianism because uh, the advocates of Confucianism uh, who contributed to, to this book 
uh, well, presenting the view, a poor view, uh, impoverished view of Confucianism. Well, in my uh, judgment, uh, this judgment of mine was formed uh, by learning from the uh, Japanese uh, scholars who are specializing in the uh, history of Ch uh, Chinese and uh, uh, Japanese political thought, like uh, Mariyama Masao or Mizoku Jiuzo. And uh, uh, as far as, well, this conception of uh, Confucianism is, well, concerned, well, there are a lot of the uh, competing interpretations uh, of what Confucianism is all about, even within this tradition. And uh, there is a kind of a uh, 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 liberal potential in this tradition. And uh, uh, among the uh, Western uh, scholars, like, like uh, William Theodore Dubarry uh, uh, published a book, uh, Liberal Tradition in China. And he talked about the uh, neo-Confucian liberalism or something like that. But uh, uh, anyway, to generalize, uh, Confucianism is committed to moral control of politics. And uh, uh, it's not just mean that uh, a ruler govern the people by ruler's own virtue. Ruler's virtue itself must be always critically checked. Mm -hmm. Ruler's must be under moral control of his own mm -hmm. uh, great scholars and people. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me uh, mention one important aspect of the uh, uh, Confucianism. Uh, I don't know how to translate uh, this term into English. In Japanese, uh, Confucian terminology, dai dou shiso. Anyway, it is a principle that the world is the world's world. Tenka wa tenka no tenka nari. Which means the world is not private property of the king mm -hmm. or the emperor. If the emperor abuses his political power to pursue his own private interests, at the sacrifice of public interest, then he would lose moral entitlement to govern the world. And uh, so in Confucian uh, tradition, revolution, or even the monarch, uh, killing monarch are justified in this line. This kind of a very critical and even revolutionary element of the uh, uh, Confucianism is totally, I'm afraid, neglected in the book. So if, well, properly reinterpreted, the alliance between Confucian and uh, Sandel's rebellion is quite welcome, mm -hmm. even for uh, a person like me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Professor Han? Yes. Uh, Michael, I think you're absolutely right. We are all reacting to uh, or against the dominant self-images of our societies and against the excesses of our societies. I think one, one interesting way to look at w what, it, what it means to encourage the revival of, of uh, Confucianism in, in East Asia, I, I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of, of, uh, of Korea here, but, uh, but there is also an article in, in this uh, uh, volume, which uh, written by Robin Wong, which deals with the gender issue mm -hmm. and Confucianism. Now, she 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 has a very interesting interpretation of of Confucianism and what it means for for women and gender issues. But of course, if you were to talk about reviving Confucianism in Korea, the biggest constituency against it would be women, hmm. <laughs> because for them. Uh, Confucianism is almost misogynist um, because given how it is still deeply rooted in Korea where 70% of Koreans still families perform ancestor worship. We're the only country in the world that actually persists in performing ancestor worship according to Chushi Jari uh, exactly to, to, the, to the letter. Now what that means socially is that of course on lunar Thanksgiving and New Year coming up soon. Of course, we have this massive migration of families all going back home to their villages, which means that even if you were the C woman CEO of a major corporation, what do you do when you go back to your in-law's house? You, you go into the kitchen and you cook. You prepare for the ancestor worship. Now, that's put, so there's a, you know, the, Again, it, it's what the dominant self-images of, of the society. And so there are 
it would be interesting to see what, how Chinese women react to this particular uh, revival of Confucianism, other than the way that Robin Wong has done. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I think we're going to turn now to the audience, but first, I, I think in the audience is one of the contributors to the book, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Professor Zhu Huiling. And I wonder, Professor Zhu, if you would like to say any very brief comments, either about your contribution or about your reactions to the panel, and then we'll open it up more broadly. Thank you so much for this great opportunity. And uh, it's my great honor to have one of my articles to be included in Michael's new book. I, I, I've been studying Michael's political philosophy since I was a um, doctoral candidate. I think uh, I would like to, I prefer to uh, label Michael's political philosophy as, um, as the republicanism rather than communitarianism not because it's too narrow or to think or to think um, but because it's uh, too narrow to uh, include uh, Michael's political philosophy he and um, polit um, uh, professor Sandel uh, uh, emphasize um, the um, constitutive self and the um, civic virtue, the relationship and between um, politics and morality, which makes make it more suitable for us to categorize, categorize his political philosophy as republicanism rather than communitarianism, and which make it, his political philosophy um, corresponds somehow to Confucianism. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why he is so popular in China. And uh, uh, because uh, most of the Chinese uh, are easy to accept um, his, most of his ideas, and such as the civic virtue, uh, his emphasis on loyalty and patriotism and the um, relationship between between politics and morality. And so in the academic field, many people are uh, doing research on liberalism. And some are doing research on the relationship between liberalism and uh, Confucianism. They, they, they are trying to combine the two theories. And some of uh, other uh, intellectuals are doing some research research on con conservatism, but, but I, uh, I don't think there are too many people are doing some research on republicanism. I think it's, uh, uh, it, it is a valuable uh, p political theory we, should, we Chinese should, to, should pay more attention to. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm, I don't want, as a very young Chinese scholar, I don't or want to label myself as a liberalist or um, <laughs> Confucianist <laughs> and or other um, uh, theory, but I do want to combine some mm. some um, some theories from other, mm. such as uh, re especially more emphasize on civic republicanism. Mm -hmm. um, but I do have some doubts to Michael's um, observation about the um, pe people's reaction in China. Mm -hmm. uh, I I think that uh, your sample isn't isn't limited because the, in China um, the people uh, who have the chance to attend your lecture are um, students from very famous universities. And all, all some ethnic from uh, eth ethnic from commercial uh, com commerce mm -hmm. ethnic. Mm -hmm. They are successful mm -hmm. students of all people, yeah. so they pay less attention. It's easier for them to pay less attention to fairness or just mm, they 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 are easy to mm, to to pursue individual success. Mm. So uh, if you have uh, next time, um, <laughs> if you have chance to have a bigger 
earlier <laughs> or a bigger uh, composition of um, of uh, audience. Yeah. I think maybe you have a different answer. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that. So next Thank time you. we'll we'll send him out to Ningxia or Qinghai <laughs> and um, see how they react to his to his arguments. Okay. Um, I think we will open the floor um, and I will ask people. I think there are there are at least a couple of microphones around. Is that correct? Who has the microphones? We have just one microphone here, or do we have two? Okay, and so I will ask you um, to please be very brief, to first identify yourself briefly, then be very brief, and if you wish to direct your question to a particular person, to please um, do so, but I'll take a number of different questions, and then we'll turn back to, to the panelists. So please raise your hands, we'll take one right there. I have two. <laughs> One question, and please identify yourself okay. and be quite uh, Just one brief. question? Yes. Okay. Uh, all right. I'll try to make two to one then. Uh, Chen, uh, from medical school, actually. Uh, so I guess the two questions I have are related. Uh, the first one was initially, what was your initial motivation to write the book? Why now? And, you know, you know, you've been working on justice and uh, philosophical questions, but why now the contrast between the sort of the Western culture philosophy and the Confucianism and the Chinese culture. The second one is about the export of values and the philosophy, because uh, World War II, uh, after that, uh, I think the United States has been very actively involved in the development in Korea, South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. For example, baseball was, bought, was you know, brought by Americans to uh, South Korea and Japan. Um, so basically, under the surface of substance material, the U.S. is also exporting values, philosophies, to those East Asian countries. So if you watch uh, the news from now from the uh, administration of President Xi, so one belt, one road, we have actually have uh, really ramping up our effort to export the Chinese philosophy, Chinese values, to a lot of countries all, all over the world, for example, South America. Uh, and Africa. Okay, so, I think we've got the okay, idea. Yeah, so what's um, the implications of that? That's all right, all. thank you very much. You. Uh, and then over here, this lady on the edge yeah, there. Jenny is uh, okay. Um, thank you, panelists. Um, I'm Chen Ye from Cover, Cover Candy School. Um, yesterday I also attended the uh, Belfort Center's um, lunch. Um, and thank you, Professor Ham. So my question is to both Professor Ham and Professor Sando. Um, in Professor Sando's speech, uh, I remember you mentioned the default setting in the context of a rising China's GDP and economic growth. And you, uh, to me, uh, I feel that uh, national, nationalism and Confucianism is uh, com uh, competing with each other, are competing with each other in China. But uh, from uh, Professor Hom's speech, I feel a sense of that uh, Confucianism is a prey for nationalism. And I do agree with that personally because uh, at least for the, the region, I mean, at least in North, uh, North Asia, it is really a danger if uh, nationalism is on the rise because, you know, China, Japan, Korea will have very com uh, complicated history. So um, I wonder if uh, uh, Professor Ham would uh, elaborate on this, and I was also want to hear um, response from a prof a Professor Sando. Thank, thank you. Professor Mansbridge down here. Can we have a microphone? Thanks very much. I address this to Michael and to the other panelists. I've worried a bit about the use of the word liberalism here because liberalism has many facets and it has GDPism and it has openness to new ideas. Um, I wonder if we might want to disaggregate liberalism a bit and I appreciate the comments of the panelists on that. Thank you. Uh, yes, here in the middle. Put your hand up, please. Uh, hi, Dr. Sandel and other panelists. I'm uh, Wei Xiangliang. I'm from uh, Boston University School of Public Health. Um, I want to ask what's the implication for uh, China, like the authoritarian regime? What's the implication of Confucianism today? Because I'm from Taiwan. Uh, actually, we have the strong anxiety from China. I, I, I believe everybody 
maybe can I uh, understand, but <laughs> especially uh, for Taiwan or some countries in East Asia other than China. China. So what's the implication for Confucianism? Thank you. Um, so we'll take just a couple more and then turn back mm -hmm. to our panelists and have another round. Uh, we'll take those two right there. Uh, thank you. I'm Hao Jin. I'm visiting scholar of Fairbank Center. Uh, my question is for, for Sandel. Uh, I, I heard at least two professors here talk about combining the Confucianism with Marxism. I want you to hear your response. How to combine these two kinds of philosophy, Marxism and Confucianism? <laughs> thank you. And right next to you there, and then we'll go back to the panelists. Hello, I'm Zhang from Kennedy School, and my question is for Professor Sandra. Um, you know, in China, I'm wondering how to balance the social impact and profit for the uh, you know, business, uh, some business uh, company just like this, to the Chinese special context. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Michael, would you like to take a crack at some of these? Okay, so some of them have overlapping themes. Sure. Um, what's the motivation to engage in comparative philosophy? Um, what's the relation between nationalism and Confucianism? Are they competing or are they mutually reinforcing? Um, can we disaggregate what we mean by liberalism? Is it GDPism, openness to new ideas, or something else? Uh, related is the question, what's the implication of Confucianism for China today, which uh, is related in turn to this last question about the, the relation between Confucianism and Marxism. Well, there are these do overlap a lot, really. Um, and I think the... Um, First, as for motivation, I think that comparative philosophy, Joseph made this point in his talk, comparative philosophy should not mainly be, in my view, the uh, comparative history of ideas. There's a place for that, and scholars can do uh, useful work in that. But that's not really what's most interesting, at least to me. What's most, well, for me, what motivates uh, an attempt to engage in comparative philosophy is um, the aspiration to, for mutual learning. And to do that, it's necessary for the interlocutors to take the ideas seriously, not just as episodes in the history of ideas. And to take them seriously means to question and challenge and reason and argue about how to interpret the respective philosophical texts. Now, this element of argument and interpretation is also partly a response to the earlier disagreement or difference of emphasis that came from the panel discussion about whether Confucianism today in China is uh, dangerous uh, cover for traditional authoritarian practices or whether it holds the promise of providing a moral foundation that can fill a vacuum of meaning. That's a big unanswered question that has come up here and we've not fully resolved. I would like to, I suppose, qualify my hopeful answer by saying the implication of Confucianism for China today depends, and what it depends on is whether it's just taken off the shelf, so to speak, as a political tool or an ideological instrument, in which case I would have the same fears that Chaibong articulated, if that's all it is. But if instead uh, it's considered that the, the the attention to the Confucian tradition is understood as an attempt, initially by scholars, as it would have to be, but ultimately for a wider public, to engage with a, an interpretive project, competing interpretations, including, to take the one example that 
I think is very important that came up earlier, the role of women. One of the very interesting uh, essays in the book by Robin Wang, uh, a Confucian uh, scholar who's interested in feminist theory, she's offered a kind of interpret reinterpretation of the Confucian tradition that is more hospitable to feminism than is commonly supposed. That's the kind of, now, others may disagree with that reading, but it's the starting point for uh, an argument, for a debate about how to interpret a tradition. And if that interpretive project can get going, then I think the Confucian tradition can be potentially an important moral resource for public philosophy but not if it's just the off-the-shelf ideological tool variety. And maybe that's the greater risk. It may well be. But then the, the solution to that, the response to that is, all right, let's jettison the, the tradition. I think that's too quick. I think the response is, well, that's the wrong way to go about it. We have to provide an alternative, a, a constructive, contestable, interpretive project that can attend to this very important moral tradition, um, but with arguments, with disagreements, with competing interpretations. Professor Chan? Yes, I'd like to pick up uh, Michael's response to this various, various question as well as to Chai Bong's uh, comment. Uh, first of all, let me say I was totally struck by what you said. Uh, that now you are not a Confucian, uh, because uh, I have not seen you for some time yeah. now, I realize. Uh, and, That's uh, why. Yeah, yeah. People have changed. No, I don't think, I don't know. I, I think the world that you, that you have observed has changed. Mm -hmm. And um, I can perfectly understand where you come from, because uh, in Taiwan, people are reacting against Chinese culture including Confucianism, simply because they come from mainland China. Uh, in Hong Kong, we are following the steps of Taiwan. <laughs> now this overbearing hegemony of Beijing, you know, uh, looms so large in our minds that we, we feel we have to resist everything that is somehow, somewhat related to this thing called China. And of course, you know, uh, but of course there are other people in mainland China who again see wrongly or correctly the association between the rise of China and the core of Confucianism, then they, they have taken the right of the rise of China to, to think that yes, China is so big and so powerful now because we are a Confucian country. So let's talk about Confucianism and let's reject completely all these foreign ideological apparatus and framework. Let's just have total self-confidence in our own indigenous culture. I think that is an extremely dangerous move. Uh, but go back to uh, uh, Chai Bong's concern. Let's say we destroy Confucianism. Let's say we also either destroy China mm -hmm. or turn China into just another liberal democratic country. Mm -hmm. Then we ask this question, what can China contribute? What can a modern China, powerful China, contribute to the project of modernity if it is just a, another affluent capitalist liberal democratic country that with all the ills and drawbacks that we've seen in the West. My conclusion is that we want China to become a much better country and also to contribute to the whole thing called modernity by experimenting on something which is not what we have seen in the West, but realizing that in its own culture there are all kinds of you know, bad practices that we want to strip off, combining things that make China or other great civilizations you know, a, a source of uh, insight or new additions to the ideas of modernity. So in that sense, we can talk about Christianity or other tradition of religion, but in China, it happens that Confucianism or a bit of Taoism you know, and Buddhism 
are still these traditional sources of uh, moral imagination, so to speak, yeah. for us to tap on yeah. and to build a better country for not just the Chinese people, but for mankind. Mm -hmm. Yes, Professor, you know it. Someone asked the question, why Confucianism now? And uh, I think there are two answers. And uh, well, um, I don't think these answers uh, will reflect the uh, real motivations of the publisher of, of, our, of this book. But uh, one is about the uh, concern about the political context of contemporary China. As you know, communist government even though they are officially upholding the Marxist creed, uh, actually they abandoned it. The reality of the uh, China is a kind of a state to govern capitalism. A little bit as well, well, uh, very, very uh, savage kind of uh, uh, capitalism. Uh, in my view, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, this, discussing Confucianism is safer for Confucian uh, Chinese scholars than discussing Marxism. If you take Marxism seriously, then you have to deny the legitimacy of the current uh, Chinese regime. This is one cynical reason. The another more sympathetic reason is this. I, I, I said earlier that uh, uh, advocates of the uh, Confucianism in this book, uh, their view of con con I rather, I, I said in a rather dismissing way that uh, their conception of Confucianism is rather poor or something like that. But uh, there is a, a, a little bit understandable well, element in their endeavor. Uh, even those people who emphasize the importance of the uh, uh, values of harmony or the uh, 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 primacy of social roles, even those people are the very uh, important provisors, uh, like that uh, this kind of harmony is not unitary or repressive, or social law division is not a fixed one. It, 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 it's open to diversity and fluid accommodation or something like that. So uh, as for well, Chinese scholars, uh, the politically uh, effective way to give some uh, critical edge uh, to, to their argument is to reinterpret Confucian philosophy, uh, not in a radical way, uh, but in a, uh, a, a moderate way, uh, but which is, uh, still has some uh, critical implications. Uh, so l l let me, uh, well, uh, revise my little bit harsh comment on that. Uh, <laughs> sure. Um, I think they're all all the questions are related in very interesting ways. Um, let me just start with the national, nationalism, Confucianism. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's, you, you'll find many na early nationalist thinkers in China, Korea, and, and I don't, maybe in Japan too, who, uh, who call for the discarding of Confucianism for nationalist purpose. So there's no natural linkage between nationalism mm -hmm. and Confucianism. Right. As I said again, you know, Confucianism is a universalizing philosophical system, so it doesn't matter. You can be a Korean or Chinese or Japanese or American if you want to be, you can, and you can still be a, a, a Confucian, but nationalism is something very different. And so what is interesting, of course, is when nationalism starts to appropriate Confucianism for its own purposes. That's, that's where things become very dicey and, and dangerous, and that's what I wanted to uh, point out. Um, and the second comment relates to both the question about disaggregating liberalism and, and uh, concept of liberalism. And, and, but one, I think the way in which at least I'm using the term is, is really about individual freedom uh, in, in that sense. Uh, also about market, but I think it's connected in that way, but focus, let's focus on individual freedom. And I think if you contrast liberalism, that kind of liberalism and Confucianism, the way I would put that is, um, I would put the, describe the difference is to, is to in, in liberalism, we err on the side of individual freedom. That is, we 
we say that, for instance, if it's, it's, it's individual versus community or something, we first try to emphasize it, it could be wrong, it could go wrong, it could be excessive, but we give the pride of place to, to the individual. In, in Confucianism, I think the way I view it is that you give, you give the person in position of authority the, the benefit of the doubt. That you somehow say that, okay, if that person is a teacher or, or senior person, somebody higher up in the, or in, in the bureaucracy or whatever, you think that that person had gotten there for, for whatever uh, better, some good reason, and that you defer to that person. And so the first instinct of a traditional Confucian society is you, you err on the side of authority. Right. And so I think that's where, for instance, where, what's the connection, what's the implication of Confucianism for authoritarianism? And I think that's, that's the propensity. That's, that has always been the dominant propensity of Confucianism to err on the side of, of, of authority. Right? That somehow authority is deserved, that, that you give the benefit of the doubt and you give him a chance first to try things out. And I, I think that's, that's the... Uh, that's the danger of, of Confucianism. Professor Chu, do you wish to make any comments? Maybe we can make more mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll turn open for one more round here. Um, and let me choose you in the front here, Francesca, right here. Hi, thank you very much. I'm Sherry from law school. Uh, so my question is about, um, can you tell us about more about the relationship between uh, moral control and the role of law? Because the discussion today let me think about the Confucianism and legalism. So uh, um, like in the case, Professor Sandel mentioned the price control. So what's the relationship between moral and the role of law? Thanks. Okay. Yes. Gentlemen. Hi, I'm uh, Hassan Masood. I'm a Knight Fellow at MIT. We've uh, heard a lot about Confucianism in the sort of East Asian context, but I'm just wondering, but perhaps from Professor Perry or Professor Sandel, if you could tell a little bit about the adoption or uh, otherwise of uh, ideas, debates around Confucius within the Western philosophical tradition today, or perhaps within the educational tradition. Yeah. There's something mm -hmm. right there. Uh, Elton Chen from Yale and U.S. College. Uh, I have a question for Professor Sandel. In the book, you mentioned that uh, you sort of see that now that some civic virtue might also be moral virtues for people to be good people, not just good citizens. The Confucian case, however, is that it's the other way around. We want people to be good human beings, and therefore from them they become like good citizens. So I, you talk about one side of the case. I wonder what your opinion is on the other side of the case. Thank you. And, uh, we have a mic that can go. Where's the other microphone? Yeah, to the left there and then to the right. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Jane Chu. I'm a Knight Fellow at MIT. Um, so I, uh, my um, 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 my uh, the point I would like to raise is related to what Professor Perry was saying early on about how to fill the vacuum of uh, a, a vacuum of uh, um, of mo um, of morality in China. So Ch uh, so the Chinese government is leading this very strong campaign to push uh, Confucianism, not just within China, but beyond the border internationally as, as well. So I just wonder what um, are the implications or concerns about this, uh, this kind of uh, top-down led initiative to push um, one ideology, philosophy, or religion, if you call it, you know, people tend to think Confucius in different shades of, uh, of uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, thinking. And uh, because uh, I guess we, you know, already aware of, um, you know, the kind of a lack of religious freedom, for instance, in China. So I just wonder, you know, whether this kind of initiative would exacerbate the situation. Thank you. Young man over there. Hi, I'm Zach from the law school, and my question is directed to Professor Sandel. And in your conversation with Joseph, uh, when you're discussing about the institutions such as the open space to cultivate the civic <laughs> virtue, but my question is uh, confronting the certain technological architectures such as Facebook and Twitter, 
as we witness and law school professors like Sunstein and Lessig also mentioned about how they can influence the deliberation process and how civic virtue is funded. Um, do you think that both republicanism and liberalism are both under the same attack? And also how Confucianism, like in the institutions in China and the technical architecture, how they design it can resist this kind of um, technical change? So we'll take just two more questions. Francesca, right there in the middle. Um, hello, my name is Dave from Boston University, study comparative religion, also uh, about Confucianism. My question would be, um, like right now in China, there are a lot of uh, like ministry about uh, Confucianism and also about relationship between business and also Confucianism. Like, um, like for example, like Changjiang Business School actually have a lot of people teaching Confucianism, more like you know for people who are doing business more like, you know, kind of a shared uh, value about Confucianism. Um, and also uh, thinking about uh, the ministry, uh, you know, compared with, you know, Christianity as churches and also like, um, I've been to India, so like India uh, trip, India has a lot of temples too, like Buddhism has a lot of temples too, but like Confucianism right now, like actually in terms of ministry, what kind of, you know, policy should be better. Okay, okay, thank you. And a yeah. final, is there a final question right in the middle there? Uh, hello, uh, I'm Zhu Wanren from the Harvard Yanqing Institute. Uh, I got a question for Professor Han. Uh, my question is that uh, <clears throat> uh, you said you uh, stopped being a Confucianist. <laughs> so my question is that, <clears throat> well, uh, 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 you stop uh, uh, being a Confucianist, but uh, can you adopt uh, uh, totally uh, abandon the Confucian <coughs> the Confucian traditions? Mm. For example, <coughs> would you allow your son to call your first name? <laughs> <laughs> so, so my question is really that uh, sometimes it's kind of easy to abandon the official ideology, mm. and uh, but. And can we uh, totally abandon the uh, a part, uh, the, the culture that is uh, essentially a part of a, our tradition? Okay, thank you. Thank you. These were uh, terrific questions, and I know there'll be many more, but you'll have an opportunity uh, after we uh, formally close this <coughs> session to talk to the panelists out there in the lobby during the book signing. So let me turn back again first to the other panelists, and then I'll give Michael the final word here. So um, those of the other panelists who would like to make responses? Well, I guess I'll... I'll have to. <laughs> um, thank you for the question. Uh, um, I think your question really gets to the heart of the issue. Uh, um, speaking as a Korean, uh, we're very Confucian. There's no escaping it. Um, so our language is completely, well, it's best fit for Confucian. I always wonder whether Korean language was the one that we use today is created by Confucians, or it, <laughs> or it just it, it just happened to fit Confucian because it's incredibly hierarchical. Right? As, as some of you know, we we have thirteen different ways to say please eat, depending on the term you use for the king and to to, to your slave, right? So, um, and you have to be a perfect master of of, of that language when you when you talk to your your uh, you know, classmates, your one year senior, two year senior, your oh. teachers, and it's it's a it's a very complicated language that that constantly reinvests the sense of you know authority uh, relations, uh, but family relations. Um, it's so it, it, so what I'm saying is that it's not that we can we can ever escape this, at least not in my lifetime or my generation. <laughs> it, it would seem. But then the question of whether you would then advocate Confucianism, that's something. So you could be a, 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 a for a Korean woman to be criticizing Confucianism, that's perfectly fine. She's, she's a Confucian. She's probably more Confucian than almost anybody in, in certain ways. But then ideationally, she, she would be a severe critic 
and of, of not, not just in terms of theory, but of course the, the institutions that, that she thinks derive from, from uh, <coughs> Confucianism and that she feels is very oppressive for, uh, for her gender. So it, it's, you know, it, it's, not ne it's never a, a, a matter of abandoning your tradition. It's just how you, how you deal with that, that tradition. There's some ways of affirming it and some ways, ways of rejecting it. It's just, again, trying to read, be able to read, or have your own position, have your own view, judgment as to what, which position was required at a certain juncture in, in your country's history or your, so, your society's evolution. And I think that's really, again, it, as I said at the beginning, an in, really in, in, interesting challenge put forth to, to any intellectual. Uh, do you adopt, adapt to changing times? Do you adapt your philosophy to changing times? Do you sometimes abandon philosophies and embrace others? I think, uh, I think it was a Claude Lévi-Strauss who said, you know, bricoleur, in the intellectual is like a, bricoleur is like a tooler, you, you, you know, you, a, a handyman. You, you know, you, 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 you're, used, you're called to do all kinds of jobs. And now, you, you normally think that philosophers are intellectual or somebody who has this grand, centered, universal vision and you just, you know, hang on to it or articulate it. But in certain ways, I find myself increasingly uh, becoming a bricoleur and trying to figure out my my place in history, where exactly I fit, and whether this means I uh, embrace or reject or you know Confucianism or other things. Thank you. Other panelists? Uh, may I? We know it? If Santa has something uh, to he'll say, have the I, last. Uh, he'll have the uh, last word. Uh, well, the, the last question. Uh, well, <laughs> mentioned the important distinction between the official ideology mm -hmm. and the uh, way of living, actual way of living. Mm -hmm. I think this is an important discussion. Mm -hmm. But as far as the way of living is concerned, it cannot be reduced to certain specific form of uh, religion. Uh, average people, uh, pu general public, most of them don't read any uh, classical text of uh, Confucius or something like that. They just re receive the uh, well traditional way of life, and also they adjust and change these forms. For example, even in Christianity, uh, countries with Christian traditions, do you think that the Christmas tree can be traced to the uh, Christian, well, religious <laughs> thought? It, it has nothing to do with that. It has a German, well, folk tradition, which cr Christians, uh, Christian missions <laughs> incorporate. And, uh, uh, there's a lot of well, uh, examples. For example, we Japanese well, uh, celebrate the birth of newborn babies in the Shinto style, and also wedding ceremony in the Shinto style. But as far as people died, <laughs> we well, conduct our funeral in a Buddhist style. So it's a kind of a religious syncretism. The people <laughs> well, uh, are just, just not passive. They are, well, actively, well, uh, develop their way of life, well, absorbing some part of this religion and other part of this religion, well, like that. So I don't think if you were really interested in the, uh, the way people live, then uh, I think you should abandon the, some religion has a, well, dominant influence on the way people live. Thank you. Um, Professor Chen, Professor Chu, no? Neither of you. Okay, in that case, we will turn back to Professor Sandel for his concluding thoughts. On the relation between civic virtue and moral virtue, I think it goes both ways. I think to be a good citizen uh, cult can cultivate um, uh, qualities of character that are important to living a good life. I also uh, agree with Aristotle that uh, to live a good life, um, it's not enough simply to display private virtues or virtues related to one's immediate family, but it's also necessary to engage with the world, to deliberate with fellow citizens about the collective destiny. That uh, element of sharing, of participating in self-rule, develops qualities of, of character and judgment and concern that we can't fully realize um, 
in private life or even family life alone. Now, holding those two views um, gets me in trouble sometimes with my liberal friends and in a few cases also with Confucian scholars who, um, who questioned that uh, view of the relation between the two. I would just uh, like to conclude, um, may I read just a few sentences sure. to conclude? Uh, it's about the project of mutual learning and it goes back to the question, what motivates all this? Um, and it's also, well, why, why do this and what can one learn? Not only by doing comparative philosophy, but for that matter, by being curious and traveling. Any project of mutual learning between Chinese and Western philosophy should begin by acknowledging a certain asymmetry. Our friend and former colleague Tu Wei Ming once observed that China is a learning civilization, whereas the West is a teaching civilization. He didn't mean this as a compliment to the West. I think he was suggesting that societies that see themselves as delivering instruction to the rest of the world fall into a certain hubris. Their teaching devolves into preaching. Beyond generating resentment, a civilization bent on teaching and preaching loses its capacity to encounter the world, to listen and to learn from it. Uh, that's really the spirit that animates this project as far as I'm concerned. And so I really just want to close by saying that, uh, that I'm so grateful to my colleague Liz Perry and to the panelists, um, not only for, uh, in the case of the panelists, traveling a great distance to be part of this discussion, but also for what I take to be the gift, and it is a gift, of their critical engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. I would like to thank Professor Sandel for uh, this uh, wonderful presentation. Thank Professor Chan, Professor Chu, Professor Ham, Professor Inoue, and all of you. And again, to thank the co-sponsoring uh, institutions, the Asia Center, the Fairbank Center, the Korea Institute, the Safra Center, and especially the staff of the Harvard Yenjing Institute and Lindsay Strogatz, who did all the hard work. Thank you very, very much.